And we're back. Second Chronicles chapter 7. Titled The Temple Dedication. When Solomon finished praying, a bolt of lightning out of heaven struck the whole burnt offering and sacrifices and the glory of God filled the temple. The glory was so dense that the priests couldn't get in God. So sorry, uh, the glory was so dense that the priests couldn't get in. God so filled the temple that there was no room for the priests. When all Israel saw the fire fall from heaven and the glory of God filled the temple, they fell on their knees, bowed their heads and worshiped, thanking God. Yes, God is good. His love never quits. Then the king and all Israel worshiped, offering sacrifices to God. King Solomon worshipped by sacrificing 22,000 cattle and 120,000 sheep at the dedication of the temple. The priests were all on duty. The choir and orchestra of Levites that David had provided for singing and playing anthems to the praise and love of God were all there. Across the courtyard, the priests blew trumpets. All Israelites were on their feet. Solomon set apart the central area of the courtyard in front of God's temple for sacred use and there sacrificed the whole burnt offerings, grain offerings, and fat from the peace offerings. The bronze altar was too small to handle all these offerings. This is how Solomon kept the great autumn feast of booths. For seven days, there were people there all the way from the far northeast, the entrance to Hamath, to the far southwest, the brook of Egypt. A huge congregation. They started out celebrating for seven days and then did it for another seven days, a week for dedicating the altar and another for the feast itself. Two solid weeks of celebration. On the 23rd day of the seventh month, Solomon dismissed his congregation. They left rejoicing, exuberant over all the good God had done for David and Solomon and his people, Israel. Solomon completed building the temple of God and the royal palace, the projects he had set his heart on doing. Everything was done success, satisfaction. God appeared to Solomon that very night and said, I accept your prayer. Yes, I have chosen this place as a temple for sacrifice, a house of worship. If I ever shut off the supply of rain from the skies or order the locusts to eat the crops or send a plague on my people and my people my God, defined people, respond by humbling themselves, praying, seeking my presence, and turning their backs on their wicked lives, I'll be there, ready for you. I'll listen from heaven, forgive their sins, and restore their land to health. From now on, I'm alert day and night to the prayers offered at this place. Believe me, I've chosen and sanctified this temple that you have built. My name is stamped on it forever. My eyes are on it and my heart in it always. As for you, if you live in my presence as your father David lived, pure in heart and action, living the life I've set out for you, attentively obedient to my guidance and judgments, then I'll back your kingly rule over Israel. Make it, sh make it a sure thing on a sure foundation. The same covenant guarantee I gave to David, your father, I'm giving to you. Namely, you can count on always having a descendant on Israel's throne. But if you or your sons betray me, ignoring my guidance and judgments, taking up with alien gods by serving and worshiping them, then the guarantee is off. I'll wipe Israel right off the map and repudiate this temple I've just sanctified to honor my name. And Israel will be nothing but a bad joke among the peoples of the world. And this temple, splendid as it is, as it now is, will become an object of contempt Tourists will shake their heads saying, what happened here? What's the story behind these ruins? Then they'll be told the people who used to live here betrayed their God, the very God who rescued their ancestors from Egypt. They took up with alien gods, worshiping and serving them. That's what's behind this God visited devastation. Second Chronicles chapter eight, titled more on Solomon. At the end of 20 years, Solomon had quite a list of accomplishments. He had built the temple of God and his own palace, rebuilt the cities that Hiram had given him and colonized them with Israelites, 
marched on Hamath Zobah and took it, fortified Tadmor in the desert and all the store cities he had found in Hamath, he had founded in Hamath, built the fortress cities Upper Beth Horon and Lower Beth Horon, complete with walls, gates, and bars, built Balath and store cities, built chariot cities for his horses. Solomon built impulsively and extravagantly whenever a whim took him, and in Jerusalem, in Lebanon, wherever he fancied. The remnants from the original inhabitants of the land, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, uh, Jebusites, and all non-Israelites, survivors of the holy wars, bless you, were rounded up by Solomon for his gangs of slave, slave labor. The policy is in effect today, but true Israelites were not treated this way. They were used in his army and administration government leaders and commanders of his chariots and charioteers. They were also the project managers responsible for Solomon's building operations, 250 in all in charge of the workforce. Solomon brought Pharaoh's daughter from the city of David to a house built especially for her, because he said, My wife cannot live in the house of David, king of Israel, for the areas in which the chest of God has entered are sacred. Then Solomon offered whole burnt offerings to God on, an altar of, on the altar of God that he had built in front of the temple porch. He kept to the regular schedule of worship setting down by Moses set down by Moses, Sabbaths, new moons, and the three annual feasts of unraised bread, Passover, weeks, Pentecost, and booths. He followed the practice of his father David in setting up groups of priests carrying out the work of worship, with the Levites assigned to lead the sacred music for praising God and to assist the priests in the daily worship. He assigned security guards to be on duty at each gate. That's what David, the man of God, had ordered. The king's directions to the priests and Levites and financial stewards were kept right down to the fine print. No innovations, including the treasuries. All that Solomon set out to do, from the groundbreaking of the temple of God to its finish, was now complete. Then Solomon went to Ezion, Geber, and Elath on the coast of Edom. Hiram sent him ships and with them veteran sailors. Joined by Solomon's men, they sailed to Ophir in East Africa, loaded on 15 tons of gold and brought it back to King Solomon. Second Chronicles chapter 9. The queen of Sheba heard of Solomon's reputation and came to Jerusalem to put his reputation to the test, asking all the tough questions. She made a showy entrance, an impressive retinue of attendants and camels loaded with perfume and much gold and precious stones. She emptied her heart to Solomon, talking over everything she cared about, and Solomon answered everything she put to him. Nothing stumped him. When the Queen of Sheba experienced for herself Solomon's wisdom and saw with her own eyes the palace he had built, the meals that were served, the impressive array of court officials, the sharply dressed waiters, the cupbearers, and then the elaborate worship extravagant with whole burnt offerings at the temple of God, it all took her breath away. She said to the king, it's all true, your reputation for accomplishment and wisdom that reached all the way to my country is confirmed. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it for myself. They, did, they didn't exaggerate. Such wisdom and elegance far more than I could ever have imagined. Lucky the men and women who work for you, getting to be around you every day and hear your wise words firsthand. And blessed be your God, who has taken such a liking to you, making you king. Clearly, God's love for Israel is behind this, making you king to keep a just order and nurture a God-pleasing people. She then gave the king four and a half tons of gold and sack after sack of spices and precious stones. There hasn't been a cargo of spices like the ship hole, the shipload the Queen of Sheba brought to King Solomon. The ships of Hiram also imported gold from Ophir, Ophir along with fragrant sandalwood and expensive gems. The king used the sandalwood for fine cabinetry in the temple of God and the royal palace, 
and for making harps and dulcimers for the musicians. Nothing like that shipment of sandalwood has been seen since. King Solomon, for his part, gave the Queen of Sheba all her heart's desire. Everything she asked for, she took away more than she brought. Satisfied, she returned home with her train of servants. Solomon received 25 tons of gold annually. This was above and beyond the taxes and profit on trade with merchants and traders. All kings of Arabia and various and assorted governors also brought silver and gold to Solomon. King Solomon crafted 200 body length shields of hammered gold, about 15 pounds of gold to each shield, and about 300 small shields, about half that size. He stored the shields in the house of the forest of Lebanon. The king made a massive throne of ivory with a veneer of gold. The throne had six steps leading up to it with an attached footstool of gold. The armrests on each side were flanked by lions. Lions, 12 of them, were placed at either end of the six steps. There was no throne like it in any other kingdom. King Solomon's chalice and tankards were made of gold, and all the dinnerware and serving utensils in the house of the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. Nothing was made of silver. Silver was considered common and cheap in the time of Solomon. The king's ships, manned by Hiram solar sailors, made a round trip to Tarshish every three years, returning with a cargo of, cargo of gold, silver, and ivory, apes, and peacocks. King Solomon was richer and wiser than all the kings of the earth. He surpassed them all. Kings came from all over the world to be with Solomon and get in on the wisdom God had given him. Everyone who came brought gifts, artifacts of gold and silver, fashionable robes and gowns, the latest in weapons, exotic spices, horses and mules, parades of visitors year after year. Solomon collected horses and chariots. He had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots and 12,000 horsemen in barracks, in the chariot cities and in Jerusalem. He ruled over all the kings from the river Euphrates in the east, throughout the Philistine country and as far west as the border of Egypt. The king made silver as common as rocks and cedar as common as the fig trees in the lowland hills. He carried on a brisk horse trading business with Egypt and other places. The rest of Solomon's life and rule from start to finish, one can read in the records of Nathan the prophet, the prophecy of Ahijah of Shiloh, and in the visions of Edo the seer concerning Jeroboam son of Nebat. Solomon ruled in Jerusalem all over Israel for 40 years. Solomon died and was buried in the city of David, his father. His son, Rehoboam, was the next king. Amen. Amen.